Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and today I'm going to be going over part two of the last video I did about loudness being in the mix, not the master. This is part two, where I'm going to cover three specific things. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about some maxims of mixing for loudness. I'm also going to talk about the general approach for solving for loudness, like how to achieve your maximum loudness. I'm also going to show you the simple, easy way to control the amount of clipping across your entire mix, because that was one of the points of the last video. Um, and then I'm going to show you one other thing, which is how terrible it sounds if you try to run a mix directly into a limiter, the way most videos and advice tells you to do, compared to this technique of mixing for loudness in the first place. So let's start with, um, just to get your attention, the easy way to control the total amount of clipping and therefore the total amount of loudness uh, that you end up with and how clean it is versus how many compromises you're making to the sound. So here's pretty much where we left off at the last video. I've reorganized my project a little bit. I've hidden a bunch of the buses and tracks that aren't being used just so more things are visible on the screen. I'm gonna use a different loudness meter. So right now, this is even a little louder than I left it at the last video because I replaced one or two clippers with a special kind of really lightweight limiter that I'll talk about later in the video. Uh, and the end result was it made the mix even louder by default, right? It's too loud. It, it, it is, this is not a good sound, but this is kind of where we left off, pretty much where we left off in the last video. And then we're going to take this down, and I'm going to be pulling this back out of the clippers and lowering the loudness level with one knob that I'm twiddling over on a MIDI controller off screen. So this is what we're starting with. It's essentially the same as the last video. So, strategically, strategically replacing a couple of my bus clippers with a bus limiter instead, kick this thing from negative 6.4 luffs up to negative 5.8 luffs, which is stupidly loud. It's too loud, especially for this mix, which is an artificial, bad, bad mix. This is not the kind of mix you should be trying to make loud. I was trying to make a point with the first video that even with a poorly designed arrangement and sequencing and mix, you can still get incredibly loud without ever using a mastering limiter. And there's a better way to do it, which is thinking about making careful mix decisions. So what happens if we just back all of the energy out of the clippers, which are all clipping right at zero dBFS across the ce a ceiling? This is my clip to zero method. The reason I use this method is because it makes it incredibly easy to do what I'm about to show you. I'm going to take this down from 5.8 luffs to about negative seven luffs right now. Here we go. And if you listen carefully, you noticed it sounds a little cleaner. Don't, get, don't worry, I'm gonna do this in more detail in a minute, let you really hear the differences. Now I'm gonna take it down to about negative eight luffs. Here we go. All right, I'm doing that with one knob. My entire project is being readjusted as far as how deep it's pushing all the signals into my clipper cascade, my clipping and limiting cascade across the mix, which I talked about in the last video. And it's also the subject of a whole set of videos I did on my clip to zero production strategy. I've got two major videos about that. I also have a whole handwritten 17-page guide about this strategy. Um, so let's get your attention a little bit more. <laughs> 
go back to the project. Now I'm going to do this in real time instead of stopping and starting. So I'm going to start here at negative eight loves, and I'll push it all the way up to the max that I would even dare to stress this mix, like way more than I would normally stress a terrible mix like this. Um, and I'm going to take it back and forth between negative eight and negative 5.8, okay? And I'll also hover a little bit in between at negative seven. So just watch this one here. This one's not going to update anymore because I'm going to be making the changes in real time, and this is an average of everything that's going on. This one updates like, you know, twice a second, so you'll see the values flipping around. So just watch for when this roughly hovers around negative eight versus when it roughly hovers around negative seven versus when it roughly hovers around negative 5.8 or, or thereabouts. Okay, so here we go. Just listen. All right, so what are we hearing there? We're hearing that overall, the spectral balance of the mix, the relations of lows to highs, the overall timbre and tone of the mix stays the same as we move from negative eight luffs all the way up to way over crunched at negative 5.8 luffs. What's changing is the amount of distortion that's being added into the mix by all of this nonlinear processing, all this clipping and all this limiting. So sounds are getting a little grittier, a little dirtier. There's more of a sense of kind of this unpleasant hotness that is pleasant to a point, but as it gets closer and closer to negative six and negative five, it's too much. And you're also noticing the transient response of the kick and the snare um, changing significantly. At the lower luffs level, the kick and the snare have a lot more punch. The kick has more roundness. As we crush it up into the negative 6, negative 5.8 range, uh, the kick and the snare become more of a suggestion than an actual impact. The snare gets a little thinner. The kick definitely gets thinner. Um, and they're there, you notice them. They sit in the mix where they need to to give the pulse, but they're not as satisfyingly thumpy and, you know, thwacky as they should be uh, in an ideal setting. So this is the trade-off. I'm going to talk about this when I get over to the maxims of loudest, loudness. This is the, tra the trade-off and the compromise that you play around with when you're working in loud genres and you have a legitimate reason to make a loud song. <laughs> Not every song should be loud. I'll get into that too. Um, but what I'm demonstrating here is with one knob in one place using a very simple technique, I'm able to control this mix kind of like raising or lowering the threshold or drive knob on a limiter. And so far you may be saying, yeah, big deal. Right? I could do this with a limiter. It's easier. Throw a limiter on the track. Well, no. So now what I'm going to do is just pause the video for a moment, and I'm going to turn off all the clippers and limiters across all these tracks and buses that you see here. Every single one of them, for the most part, well, a lot of them have a limiter on them or a clipper. And um, I'm going to turn those all off, and I, instead, over here on the pre-master, I'm going to put one single uh, actually, I'll just do it over here. On the master track, I'll put one mastering limiter. 
and let you hear what the same mix sounds like driven into that mastering limiter. Now, before I do that, I'm gonna set this to sit around negative seven lefts because I think that's the sweet spot for this mix. And I'll explain that sweet spot a, a little bit later. I wanna show you this last trick of why, why mixing this way, getting your loudness in the mix is so vastly superior to doing it the way most production advice teaches you to do it, which is work way low at like negative 18 RMS, negative 12 RMS. Build your mix, don't think about your peaks, don't think about your mix in terms of dynamic range. Just let every, every sound stack up on top of each other. And then, you know, in the mastering stage, you'll figure out loudness, right? No, that doesn't work and here's why. I'm gonna play this back at roughly the negative seven luffs volume. I'm gonna play that for just a, a few seconds and then I'm going to stop, pause the video, turn off all these things, set it up to use a mastering limiter instead, and then unpause the video and restart it. So you're gonna be able to jump straight from the way it sounds if you do it in the mix versus the way it sounds if you try to do your loudness at the end in a mastering limiter. Here we go. All right, hear how terrible that sounds? Now the snare is just this thin little wisp of its former self. The whole mix sounds thinner and, and kind of dead and over squashed. The kick is just not even really there at all. Um, it's fundamentally significantly different sounding than getting the same amount of loudness, even just a tiny bit more, in the mix. Okay, so hopefully this has gotten your attention. Uh, let me pause the video one more time and undo this limiter and put all the clippers back. You can see here are all these things that say track limit down in my tonal sounds. I'm using a, a special kind of limiter called track limit and they're gray, which means I turned them off. And then uh, on the tonal bus itself, it's also turned off. And then over here in the drum section, the clippers I'm using are Newfangled Saturate, so that one's turned off, that one's turned off, this one on the drum bus is turned off, and then over here on the pre-master where all my tonal sounds and kick sounds, drum sounds, blend together on the pre-master, I was using another instance of track limit here and it's also turned off. So what I'm gonna do right now is just undo this, get back to doing it the proper way in the mix. And um, then we'll go over this note card and some of the points in here to really drive some of this stuff home for you all. Okay, be right back. All right, project's back the way it was. So, <clears throat> first of all, let's get one little elephant out of the way for people that aren't familiar with this yet, because I have got some questions about this over the years. You see some red on some of my channel meters, but over here on the master, you see that it's zero. Over here on this thing called the listen bus, you see it's negative 10. All right. Be aware, understand if you don't already, that just because a channel meter, a track meter, or a bus meter goes in the red doesn't mean you're clipping on that channel. All DAWs, all of them, have 32-bit internal float processing on every channel and every summing point. Some DAWs will have even higher 64-bit processing at certain summing points. Summing points are buses. That's where sounds come together. For example, on this snare group or bus, I have two snare sounds that are being stacked together. They add up on top of each other 
And so this signal on this bus is louder than either of these two individual signals, right? This kick bus, I have one kick sound coming into it. And then in the context of the whole drum bus, I have two snares and one kick from these two buses coming together and being summed, added on top of each other at this drum bus, right? And so all these buses and tracks, they have 32-bit float processing inside, which means there is a ton of actual real headroom up above the zero mark. The zero mark is meaningless on DAW channels and tracks. There's only one place that zero is meaningful in a DAW, and that is on the track that you print or burn your output masters from. When you bounce outside of the DAW to a printed WAV file or FLAC or MP3 or whatever you like to burn to, when you print, now that signal is being printed. It's being put into kind of a hard format, and then zero matters very much. So most DAWs will burn their output from the track they call master, and you never want master to go over zero, okay? Now there's another place that counts, and that's where the signal comes out of your DAW and into your operating system's sound subsystem. Okay, so I'm on Windows, and at some point in this DAW, signal comes out of the DAW and goes into Windows itself and gets passed on to my audio interface, which is a Motu M4, okay? In my particular project working style, I do not let the master be the output to my sound system in my operating system. Instead, the output of my master goes to this other track that I call the listen bus. See how the output line right down here says listen bus? So my master feeds into my listen bus, and my listen bus is turned way down compared to my master. It's turned down because I do additional um, processing just for my ears, just for my room, just for my speakers and monitors, just for YouTube when I'm recording a video like this, okay? So even if I were to let this particular number go over zero for whatever reason, it still wouldn't really be clipping. What I'm hearing would not be clipping because it's really feeding into another channel which is turned way down and way below zero, okay? So just be aware of that. I know a lot of you know this already, but some people don't. These red numbers don't mean anything. Nothing is clipping here. All the peaks are still there, okay? They're just up above zero, because DAWs allow that. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk about um, some general truths about loudness. Almost all of these are not up for debate. A maxim means something we take as true, okay? And I am absolutely 100% confident in everything I'm about to tell you. So I just want you to take this in. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Uh, I'll just say it's truth, okay? And you can, you can argue and debate with other people whether it's truth or not. Don't argue with me about it in my threads because you're just going to be wrong if you try to say any of these aren't true. So let's really understand what loudness is. Loudness, perceived loudness, measured loudness, it, it equates to something we call dynamic range, which is the difference or distance between the RMS of a signal, the average loudness of a signal, and the peaks of the signal. You could actually really just say that the loudness is the RMS, okay? Now there's another measurement called LUFS, which is basically, I'm gonna really oversimplify here, LUFS is the same exact thing as RMS, it's just measured in a different way that more accurately represents how humans perceive loudness. They throw in some psychoacoustic considerations in the way they measure it. But the numbers mean the same thing. Whether you're looking at a meter that's showing you uh, levels in terms of RMS, or I could flip this to a mode, well, okay, here it is showing levels in terms of RMS. Right? 
And if I flip it to a mode where it's showing me those same levels in terms of luffs, they're kind of the same thing. It's just that the luffs is actually more accurate according to the way humans hear it. Okay, so that's all you need to know about luffs. And most of us these days, we use luffs when we're being precise. We use RMS as close enough to luffs to be ex effectively the same thing. And in most DAWs, when you're looking at the meters here, these solid bars are the RMS and the little lines are the peak above the RMS. And the distance between that empty gap in between is the crest factor or dynamic range of that sound. So let's look at this uh, snare here. Just keep your eye on this blue track right here. See that little gap between the line and the bar? That's your dynamic range of the sound. That's your crest factor. It's the distance between the RMS where the real perceived volume of that sound is versus its highest little transient peak that might be so fast and so ephemeral and run by your ears and brain so fast you don't even hear it. You just hear the RMS. As humans, we only hear the solid bars. We don't hear those little thin orange lines at the top. Okay? So that's an important thing to know about loudness. Loudness is the RMS, and it's important in terms of dynamic range because if our goal, let's look at the master over here now. Our goal is to get the loudness, the solid bar, as high as possible without making the little thin line go above zero, the peak. We don't want the peak going above zero because Bad, bad things happen when your peaks go above zero in printed output or, you know, output to your sound cards or a streaming service trying to download things to you. Okay, so watch over here. See how small that gap is, that blank gap between the solid bar and the line? That's loudness. If this mix were less loud, I'm going to take it way, way down now. I'm going to take it down to, I don't know, something like, looking at a little thing real quick to help me with this, right? Yeah, I figured that would be about negative 12. So this is about YouTube levels of loudness, what they recommend. Look how much bigger the gap over here is now. Take it back up to negative seven-ish again. See how that solid bar stays closer to the, f between the eight and four mark. Again, if I drop it back down. See how the solid bar stays closer to the 12 mark, right? So these numbers, if the, wherever the solid bar hits here, is basically your loudness, your luffs. Point being, you can't get loud without also squishing everything into a very small dynamic range. That's where loudness comes from. It comes from the dynamic range. So... Keep that in mind. If you can really wrap your head around that, you'll struggle with loudness a lot less. Now, there's some problems. When you reduce the dynamic range, there's, there's two ways to do that. And I talked about that a little bit in the last video. I'm going to go over that more in the next part where I talk about how to actually think about making things louder when you need to. Saturation and distortion reduces dynamic range from the bottom of the sound up. It basically makes the RMS louder relative to the peak. It doesn't change the peak nearly as much as it increases the RMS, so the total distance between the peak and the RMS gets smaller, reducing the dynamic range, therefore making it louder. 
Now, the other way to do it is by clipping it, clipping or limiting the peaks from the top down. Now, there you're not changing the RMS, you're just pushing the peaks down. Again, making that distance shorter, increasing the dynamic range, and therefore increasing the loudness, okay? And the last thing to know is that despite every freaking YouTube video out there, and I get so mad when I see producers and engineers that I know, know this, but they oversimplify for newcomers and they say, oh, if you want to reduce, you know, peaks, if you want to shave some peaks off, if you want to control your peaks, put a compressor on it. And they don't tell you that the compressor, like the glue compressor in Ableton, it's not the compressor part of the glue compressor that is reducing peaks. It's a little clipper. It's a soft limiter at the end of the, of the glue compressor that's actually reducing peaks. There's a limiter inside the glue compressor, and that's what's actually clipping your peaks downward, not the compression. Downward compression does not reduce dynamic range. What compressors do is they carve an entirely new volume envelope over a span of time. If you have the attack on a compressor set to 10 milliseconds, as soon as it detects the first peak over its threshold, it starts pushing the volume downward, and it pushes it downward over a time span of 10 milliseconds. It carves a little downward-facing line, actually a curved line in most cases, kind of an algorithmic, uh, I'm sorry, an exponential or logarithmic looking line. It, curves, it carves this downward line across the first 10 milliseconds of the signal. That very first point where it started carving downward is still just as high as it was before. It doesn't actually take the, the maximum transient peak of the signal down. Not a compressor, that's not what compressors do. So compressors don't change or reduce the dynamic range. They change the dynamic feel. They make a sound a little more spiky, a little more pokey by sharpening those transients. Or they make a sound a little more warm, a little more round, a little more full by increasing the um, body portion relative to the transients. It's hard to describe that second part without going into a long demonstration. But the basic idea is when you use a compressor, it changes the dynamic feel, the pokiness or sharpness versus the kind of warmth and roundness. It doesn't change the range between the peak and the body or the sustain or the RMS of the signal. So that's a really important one. Compression is not the right tool when you need to work in louder genres and your goal is to try and squeeze all these sounds and this entire mix into a very small, tight, dynamic range, okay? So that's the first thing to understand, some really important things about what makes loudness. All right, the next thing to note, anytime you reduce the dynamic range, I mean, and that's what loudness is. You have to reduce the dynamic range. Anytime you reduce it, you are always, always adding some kind of distortion, okay? Limiters and clippers, and yes, even compressors, make this kind of nonlinear amplitude change. The sound used to be at a certain level and you are changing it in a way that isn't one for one which would be linear. You're changing it in a proportional way, very suddenly, very rapidly. And every time you do that in the digital realm, it creates distortion. It creates additional crunchiness and grit and spit and pop and high frequency and harmonic distortions and even aliasing foldback and a whole bunch of bad things that we just generally call distortion and not the good kind of distortion that sounds nice, right? Anytime you're trying to reduce the dynamic range of a sound, you are going to introduce distortion. You are compromising the original sound, okay? This is important to note. Now, the thing is, that distortion, in some cases, sounds really pleasant to us. In other cases, it might be masked by all the other sound that's going on in the mix at that specific moment when the dis little quick transient distortion pop happens, okay? And that's the key to the next thing, which is 
the notion of trying to achieve the cleanest possible loud mix is the art of compromise. How much you can reduce the dynamic range of something is limited by a constant balancing act between making the distortion as pleasant or masked as possible. And it's a balance. You can only go so far before the distortion can't be masked anymore and it becomes unpleasant, right? So there is no such thing as perfectly transparent loudness. All the sounds that you pick and arrange in a song can only be made so loud. How loud they can be made depends on a lot of things I'm going to talk about in the next section, okay? There's tricks to getting things loud. One of those tricks is using saturation and distortion that is pleasant to our ears. And then the other trick is clipping and limiting and doing this nonlinear dynamic range reduction in ways that mask as much of the ugly sounding distortion as possible. But it's never perfect. And really, really good ears, really trained ears, really young, healthy ears that still hear closer up to 14 and 16 and 18K, even 20K, the mythical 20K mark that humans supposedly can hear up to. There are people who can hear that high. And they will notice this distortion a lot more than someone who's 35 or 40 or 50. Okay, because as you get older, all your high frequency, your ability to hear high frequencies gets attenuated a lot. And, you know, most of the engineers running around making albums, I guarantee you, they can't hear clearly above 14K tops, maybe 12K, maybe even 10K, some of them. They can't hear it. They they hear, I could go off on a whole diatribe here. I have very damaged hearing. I can't hear super high. But there's ways to compensate for that when you're an engineer. You know what to do and look for and what to listen for and how to isolate and amp up those regions so you can hear them. Uh, Just not the same way a young 18-year-old who's protected their hearing and has really excellent hearing and has trained themselves to hear what distortion and aliasing sounds like, okay? Anyway, the point being, for your average audience, your average listener, it's possible to hide so much of that distortion in ways they'll never notice, never hear, and never care about. Um, And that's the art of making loud mixes, is that balance. As an engineer, you might hear it. As an engineer, it might seem like worse. But objectively, to your listening audience, is it actually truly worse with air quotes around it. That's the trick. Now, when you put all these things together, it still boils down to don't make any sound, any song louder than it needs to be. Because as you make songs louder, you are compromising them. You are making them objectively worse to an engineer with good hearing. Now, how loud should they be is very much a judgment call and across the engineer community and producer community and even the consumer community, it's a very heated debate about how loud is too loud. Does loud sound better? Some people think so, legitimately. Why? Why do they think it sounds better? Well, this is, this is an absolute truism. <laughs> Most consumers these days listen on terrible equipment in noisy environments. And in those situations, if you have a song with a wide dynamic range, it means that the quieter sounds in your mix simply won't be audible against the background noise. I used to take a train into work for six years. I would wear really good noise-canceling headphones, but even through those, I would hear all sorts of ambient noise from the train, from the cars and sirens and other crap on the streets as I walked from the train station to my office. Even at the office, you have the AC hum really loud. You have coworkers talking and you have people in a meeting room laughing really loud all of a sudden. 
And there's all kinds of background noise in the places we tend to listen to music these days, in your car, right? With um, Even if you have a fairly decent factory stereo system, it's still just a 40 amp head. And, um, you know, even if you have independent tweeters and woofers and, and mid-range drivers in your, in your SUV, they're still not that good when they come from the factory. They're just not. I've had really good sound systems in cars that cost me $1,000 to put in and were, you know, 300 watt amps and really excellent subwoofers and really excellent tweeters and mid-range. And trust me, it's not the same thing. So in a car, you've got wind noise, you've got engine noise, you've got road noise from the tires. Um, it's just, these are terrible listening environments and it's where we listen to music these days. It's not like it was in the seventies when you, you know, you had sh crappy, <laughs> sorry, almost did it where you had bad um, eight track tapes and cassette tapes. If you had anything at all and you had terrible, terrible audio back then, terrible equipment, terrible speakers in a car and cars were just as noisy back then, if not more so. Um, you didn't have iPods or iPhones. You didn't have, you know, Walkmans when they first came out were a big thing. Being able to take your music with you and listen to a cassette on little crappy headphones as you walk to class at the, at the university or high school or, or wherever, right? They didn't have that. In the 70s, the only place you really listened to music ever was in your living room, hopefully on a good turntable, and component stereo system with a fairly big amplifier. And pro audio stores sold you big hompin' speakers that were basically the equivalent of the really good um, studio monitors that you see in sound studios these days. I'm not talking eight inch uh, Yamaha HS8s or whatever your favorite seven or six or eight inch near field monitor is. I'm talking the big monitors that you see in the back of the room soffit mounted into walls. That used to be the kind of speaker system that was sold to consumers. I remember having, yes, I'm old. I remember having um, speakers with like, you know, 12 inch woofers, uh, three or four or five inch mid range drivers, and then big three inch tweeter horns in them, right? And that was standard. They sounded great, right? In a quiet living room. Yeah, there. A big dynamic range really makes a difference. It sure does. But if that's if that same record was played in a car off of a cassette tape and a crappy sound system, you had to crank the volume to the point where everything was distorting because you couldn't hear the lowest parts of the song. You couldn't hear the quieter, interesting things in the song. So everything's different now, right? Consumers listen on bad equipment in noisy environments, and so you, they want it in a small dynamic range so they can hear everything, okay? That's one driver to why songs still tend to be loud and there's still a quote-unquote a loudness war. It's not a war, it's a consumer preference, okay? You're on a treadmill in a gym, there's all kinds of other noise you're in a restaurant, there's conversation, but there's a song you're, you're interested in that's playing on the really crappy sound system in the restaurant, and you kind of want to make out what they're saying, you need it to be in a small dynamic range, okay? And then the other consideration for us people who work in um, electronic music, especially electronic dance music, or even for a lot of genres like pop um, and stuff like that, modern country, modern rock, all that stuff, you're listening to it on streaming services and you don't listen to a whole album at a time. You hear one song by one artist sandwiched in between two different songs by two other artists in a playlist. Or if you go to a live show where a DJ's, you know, playing festival bangers or, or whatever, you're hearing songs by different people, unless it's a, you know, premier producer, DJ, artist doing only their own stuff. But in most cases, you're hearing a song by one artist being live mixed into and out of two completely different songs by two completely different artists mastered by different engineers, right? So there needs to be a kind of consistency in the overall dynamic range of those songs or 
what happens is if a song with a wide dynamic range is sandwiched in between two hotter songs, louder songs with less dynamic range, that song with the wider dynamic range effectively has less saturation and distortion. Because remember, that's how you get low dynamic range. You add saturation, distortion, right? And you get more distortion from clipping or limiting it from the top down. So overall, a wider dynamic range song has less saturation distortion, and that results in a song that sounds darker, duller, and more thin by comparison to the other two songs. It may be an objectively better, punchier mix. It may be a better song in many objective ways. But if, when you put one bright song followed by this dark, dull, thin sounding song, even if it's punchy, and then you follow that up with a third song that's bright and hot again, the human brain prefers louder and brighter. It, we think that's better. And so by comparison, your song sounds dead and dingy and dull, okay? So these are the drivers why we have a loudness war, quote unquote, air quotes. It's not a war, it's just the reality of today and the way people listen to music today and where music is played today. So that's why it's a judgment call and there's heated debate. How hot should you make your song? I would say, broadly speaking, you need to make your song be as loud as every other song in the genre that you're producing. It's that simple. If you're producing uh, singer, songwriter, acoustic guitar stuff, it doesn't need to be nearly as loud and dense and crunched into a low dynamic range because those songs and, you know, hearing all the articulation of the acoustic guitar and all the emotive articulation of the singer, no, you need a wide dynamic range for that. And so does almost every other acoustic singer-songwriter. So your song is going to need to match them in terms of dynamic range, and therefore it will match them in terms of spectral balance and timbre and feel, okay? But if you make pop music, modern pop music, if you make electronic dance music, nope, you got to be loud because everyone's loud in those genres because they want to be heard on bad equipment in noisy environments. That's the story for pop music. Got to hear that singer. Got to hear everything that's important to the mix. It's all, it's all important. Need to be able to hear it. Um, or in the case of dance music, you know, live DJ sets. I can tell you as a DJ, I know when a song doesn't work in a set. I can't, you can't just turn up the, the high frequency or the mid, um, you know, EQ knobs on your, on your mixer. You can't just turn up the channel trim because everything's feeding into a front of house limiter. And you, all you're going to do is make the signal louder in amplitude in peak, and then it's going to crush the peaks into the limiter and suddenly get squashed. Right? So you can't do that. You have to just make your song sit in the same general dynamic range as all the other songs in your, in your crates. That's just how it works. Every DJ will tell you this, right? Dan Worrell, sorry, <laughs> you're kind of wrong about that. DJs have a reason for loud music. Can't just turn up the volume. Doesn't work that way, dude. Um, so anyway, now we're going to get into something that isn't a maxim. This is my opinion. It's an opinion I've held for a long time. I'm going to stick with it still even today after many years. This is based on me doing a lot of DJing and really learning how to produce songs that work for DJs in loud, festival-oriented bass music genres. And that's one of the hardest genres to really do loud, which is why I got good at this. Um, my opinion, and this is my opinion, you don't need to make a song negative six luffs. You don't need to make a song negative five or four luffs. If you're doing that, if you're doing that on purpose, if you're artificially doing it, um, you're just flexing, and it probably sounds worse than if you had made it less loud, pure and simple, and it doesn't need to be that loud. In my opinion, if you make any given electronic dance music, any festival-oriented bass music, heavy, heavy song, bass-heavy song, if you make it roughly 
somewhere in the ballpark of negative eight to negative seven integrated luffs across your loudest drop, it's going to have the same spectral balance, the same heat, the same density, the same intensity, the same perceived loudness as other songs that are hitting negative five, negative six, negative four luffs. You don't need to be, there's a certain point you hit where it's as saturated and distorted as it needs to be. It's as bright as it needs to be, and it will fit in the set just fine. It will mix cleanly from song to song. So personally, I shoot for negative seven luffs, and if the song feels a little too pushed, and I feel like dropping it down to negative 7.5 or even negative 0.8 will still, well, sounds better in, in terms of dynamics and stuff. If it's significantly better, I'll consider dropping the song down to negative 8. But I, my goal is usually to go for negative 7, and I never try to go harder than negative 7 because there's no point. Now, it is true, certain songs and the sound design in those songs might vary naturally hit louder than seven. And if you tried to drop it back to seven, it, there wouldn't be much point because you wouldn't be dropping it back down out of the mastering limiter at the end or any of the clippers in your mix. You'd literally just be moving the peaks down further away from zero. So there's no point. There are some songs that really can be super freaking loud because they're just built to be loud and the sound choices and sound design was just loud. And they just naturally sit at negative six and a half luffs or negative six luffs or hell, negative five luffs. Some. But a lot of things I hear that I, I test and I see are hitting negative six, negative five, negative four. They're artificially pushed that far. They've been cranked into that range unnecessarily. And it's just, it's sad. So I am, I am the I am not a fan of loudness for loudness sake. I'm not a fan of trying to do stupidly loud. Just make it as loud as it needs to be to match your genre, to sit in a playlist right, and to be audible enough in noisy environments. And negative seven to negative eight luffs is very much audible on bad equipment in noisy environments. It's still plenty good, right? And by pulling back down to negative seven to negative eight, instead of trying to artificially crunch it up into stupid numbers just to show you can do it, by doing that, you retain the most possible microdynamics while you're still satisfying these two constraints of being in the same ballpark as other sounds, songs in that genre, and being audible in noisy environments. So this is my opinion for an optimal kind of luffs. And it's important, it's integrated luffs. That means the average loudness across the loudest drop, or in the case of pop music, or, or you know, that would be your chorus. In the case of hip hop, that might be your, your hook. Um, whatever the loudest section in the song is, you just wanna measure it. And if it comes in at roughly somewhere between negative seven and negative eight, you are golden. That's the sweet spot, in my opinion. Other people may have different opinions. That's perfectly fine. Some people would say, even that's too loud. Okay, that's fine. Um, I look at engineers that I admire who obviously work in loud genres and know what they're doing. And I, I'll ask friends who are engineers who work in these genres. And the answer I consistently got early on was, eh, negative seven, negative eight's the ballpark. And I agree with it from my own personal observation over years. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why negative seven to negative eight is good and how to choose between those. We're gonna go back to this for a minute and I'm gonna demo really carefully this particular mix in the range of negative seven to negative eight. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bounce it between negative seven and negative eight and I'm just gonna go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between those two. And what I want you to tell me is, do you hear enough of a difference to make it worth dropping this all the way down to negative eight? So here's roughly negative seven. And here is negative eight.
They both sounded good. When I separated them with my voice, I bet most of you didn't hear any, any real significant difference at all. Now I'm going to do it continuously. I'm going to just keep it running. And I want you to watch this little knob here or watch this value here, right? When this says negative three, it's going to be roughly in the negative eight lefts range. When this says like negative two, negative 1.8, this is roughly in the negative seven range, okay? I'm just going to roll back and forth between those two. You decide which you think sounds better. And then ask yourself, yeah, but is it really all that much better? Okay, here we go. Did you hear any significant difference? I'm going to guess for most of you the answer is no. Some of you with really good ears and your personal preferences and tastes like dynamics is always better will notice that at negative eight lefts, that kick and that snare pump even more, right? They stick out just that much more. The kick has a little more roundness. The snare is a little more relaxed sounding. There's no difference, I will tell you for a fact, and I'll show you in a minute, that there's no difference between the crunchiness of the bass line and the sub bass. The only difference between negative seven lefts and negative eight lefts is the amount of squeeze that's happening to the kick and the snare. And that's the only difference. One more time. Ah, uh, damn it. I grabbed my, the wrong fader. Set this back to zero. Okay. One more time. Sorry about that. All right. Now, once we get above seven lefts and start pushing into the negative six, negative five territory, that's when you start hearing the rolling bass line, the mid bass and the sub, that combined tonal signal, you're starting to hear some crunchiness and grittiness and extra hotness and distortion on that, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is there's always a sweet spot. I believe you can get even a really crappy mix that isn't built to be loud up into the eight or seven range without too much trouble and too much damage to the sound if you do it in a mix-oriented way. As you heard though, when I earlier in the video when I took this negative seven signal and turned off all the clippers and, and limiters across the mix and tried to just do it all in one go in a mastering limiter over here on the mastering bus, it didn't sound good at all. That mix, this crappy mix, this crappy arrangement could not be made loud enough the traditional way, but it could be made reasonably loud, negative seven, negative eight, and still sound pretty good this way. Now pushing it beyond negative seven, I feel is starting to hurt things too much. And it's unnecessary for reasons I covered here. So let's talk a little bit and then I'll, I'll demonstrate a few more things. And I'm also going to demonstrate, keep hanging with me or skip ahead in the video. I'm going to demonstrate how I'm doing this trick. Um, actually, let's just do that now because I know some of your, when is Bath Metro going to explain what, what's happening here? Okay. So the trick really comes <laughs> from the very last step in my, I'm going to change my mind. Sorry. 
Yes, and I don't edit my videos because that takes way too much time. You get my brain dumps as if you were sitting here in the room with me. So just bear with me a little longer. I'll go through this faster. Um, so you're looking at a mix and you're saying, why does it sound bad when I push it up to my target loudness that I think I need to produce it at because of the genre or whatever? Um, again, don't make a song louder than it needs to be for the genre. But let's say you have something, you try and get it up close to negative seven or negative eight, and it just starts falling apart. And you're like, oh, what do I do? How do I approach somehow making this fit, reducing this dynamic range so that it can be loud enough? Well, there's a specific order of operations that I recommend, a certain way to think about the problem and work through these steps bit by bit. So what's important to understand is that loudness actually starts before the mix and way before the mastering. It starts when you're arranging and sequencing your song. Okay, proper arrangement and sequencing in louder genres is massively important. To understand this, imagine that your song is built from 10 different sounds. And every one of those sounds individually has a very low dynamic range, very high RMS, very high luffs. And so each sound is hitting exactly negative seven luffs, if you were to measure that sound by itself. And now imagine that you arrange them in your song so that only one of those sounds ever plays at any given moment throughout the song. You go from sound A to sound B to sound C, back to sound A, then to B, then to D, and you never ever stack or layer those sounds together. What loudness will your song be at the end? Exactly seven luffs, because every sound is seven luffs, and you're never summing them together. You're never layering them together and making those signals add on top of each other. Okay? So the whole trick that most accomplished producers in loud genres employ, if you really pay attention to their projects, they almost never layer sounds in the drops, in the loud sections. The drops are what we my collective used to call checkerboarding. You go from black to white to black to white to black to white. You never put black on top of white, right? You never layer sounds. Every sound in your drop is loud as f loud AF. <laughs> and uh, you know your kick is massively loud. Then that mid bass sound that comes right after your kick is massively loud. And then the snare is massively loud. And then the two little weird, you know, call and response type nasty sounds are equally loud, but they don't happen on top of each other, they happen next to each other. Now, for a better explanation of this that's a little more in-depth, I'm going to put a link to this video in the description of my video. There's a producer, engineer, teaches engineering, good guy. Um, I don't know them personally but they clearly know their stuff. And they made a really great 16 minute video once that really, really shows you this concept in action. So I highly recommend if you've never seen this video, go watch it. That will really cement that this is where loudness starts. And nine times out of 10, the reason you can't get loud is because you made mistakes with your arrangement and sequencing. You did what I did in this example song. I've made, I purposely broke several of the rules of good arrangement and sequencing, specifically to make this song the nightmare song for getting loud. And yet I was able to anyway. But this is the easy, the easy starting point. Just make your song able to be loud. Okay? Now, the next thing, after you've taken care of your arrangement and sequencing and fixed whatever you could there, Layer sounds less, put them side by side more, somehow, whatever that means. The other thing that's also kind of important, and this is one of the focuses of my clip to zero technique and this two-part video on loudnesses in the mix. Um, 
Structured busing in your project. What do we mean by structured busing? So you'll notice I have two sounds that blend together at the top going into my pre-master. All my drum sounds are in their own bus. Every other kind of sound that isn't a drum sound, all the tonal sounds are in their own bus. Even inside the drums bus, I have a kick bus, I have a snare bus, and if I were to show my hidden tracks, I have a tops bus with its own top sounds inside of it that's currently deactivated because I'm not using it in this example. Right, so I have three different sub buses of different types of drum sounds that I can blend separately with little sub bus faders and control and process separately because they're different sounds. A kick is a, is a wholly different type of sound than a snare. And both of those are different than perks and cymbals and whatever. You need different EQs, different processing, different transient shaping, different amounts of clipping or not, right? P break up your structure so that you have lower level sounds, maybe with individual processing or not, feeding into higher level buses where you do processing on that entire group of similar sounds. And if we go further in my tonal section, let's crunch this up to everything, right? Again, these are deactivated tracks, but I have all under this yellow tonal group, right? I have uh, everything boiled down to my subs, all my mid-range sounds, all my vocals, something I call drop interjects, not gonna get into that, and parallel effects. Yes, I do my effects as part of my channel structure, not as separate return tracks over here. I do this because I want to make them duck out of the way when my kick and snare hit. And that's much harder to do when you set them up as um, FX return buses or auxiliary buses. Anyway, subject for another video. Point is I've got all these different types of sounds and even some of these, like the midline sounds, I break into, I have my drop sounds, my aggressive mid basses. I have chords, I have melodies, I have lifters, I have atmospheres, I have Foley sounds. And these are all part of, they're different enough from subs and vocals that I want them in their own bus. And by putting them all in their own sub buses even further, like here's the individual sounds that are drop sounds. I'm only using one sound that's drop sound right now and I'm not using any of these. By having this organized busing structure, you can look at the signals in an oscilloscope, right? I, I have these things down here that let me look at the important buses I care about and compare and contrast the signals. Like if I wanna see what my drums bus looks like, there's my drum bus with my kick, snare, kick, snare, snare, kick, right? Here's what's going on on my tonal bus, but this is a combination of, again, if you look at my tonal bus, it's my drop sounds plus my subs in this case. Let's turn all these other tracks off again, right? I have a drop sound, I have a sub, they're summing together on my tonal bus and I wanna see what that summed signal looks like. Or maybe sometimes what I wanna see is here's the midline, here's the sub, turn off the tonal, turn off the drums, look at the layers, right? This dark blue is specifically everything in my midline, which in this case is one rolling bass sound. And then the lighter purple is my sub. Now that looks great, right? They're under zero. That line here is zero. This line here is zero. They're way under zero separately. But if I look at how they sum together, whoops, I have some peaks going above zero right here right here, a few here and here and here and here and here, right? Those peaks above zero need to get clipped. And now check this out. I'm gonna play this. Now, we're running at negative 8.2 lefts right now, right? Watch what happens when I push up to um, more like negative seven or negative six. Watch these peak areas carefully.
See how when I get up to roughly negative six lefts, there's a lot more stuff poking above the zero line? Well, that has to get shaved off somewhere because you remember, you can't go above zero by the time you finally print to master or send out to your audio card or record into YouTube or whatever. So it's this extra amount of clipping that's being done by my clipping cascade. And depending on how hard I drive all the original source signals into that clipping cascade, right? So by pulling these, by pulling the signal down out of the clippers, there's less to clip and therefore there's less distortion. And you're just, it's a balancing act. You have to find that sweet spot. So watch, I'm gonna bring it back down to seven luffs again here. Okay, now there's just a few peaks being shaved. They're really short. A lot less damage is being done to this combined sub and rolling baseline signal. It doesn't affect the individual sounds. Again, if I go back to the layers, they're staying below the zero line no matter what. But here at this tonal bus, they're going above zero by as much as, you know, 3.6 dB. Um, and I should be turning that one on so that they're actually getting limited there. So here you can see, this is these are the ones that are going above zero, but if I go to the actual tonal bus itself, that same peak area is now under zero, right? If I go back to layers, some rather, that's above zero, that's above zero, that's definitely above zero. These two spots are above zero, these spots are above zero. But by the time they run through the clipper here on the tonal bus, they're back down under zero. Okay, so you can see that by having everything broken apart across my project like this, for one, it lets me see and identify where signals are summing unnecessarily. That's this part here. By having structured busing, it's easier to visually see where things are summing up that you might not expect. It can be surprising sometimes. Now there's another reason for structured busing like this. It lets you use a lot of little small clips instead of one huge clip. And that's the essence of this mixing approach. And I think the best way for you to really, really understand this is to look at another video. This one's only five minutes long. It's done by a, um, a friend of mine who did a really good demonstration once to my producer collective when we were having a debate about is just one clipper at the end good enough? And I used to be in that camp. I used to think, oh, I just put one clipper at the end before the mastering limiter and that's good enough. And a uh, reframinator who understood how, how this really works said, no, 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 no. That's, that's gonna add way more distortion than you need. This is why you clip lots of times in small amounts all over the project. Watch this video, this link will be in my description. It will help you understand this point. But this is the reason when I play this mix through the mixed approach, it sounds so much better than when I turned all those limiters and clippers off and just drove them at one point here through a single pass of a mastering limiter. It sounded like hammered crap precisely because of the mechanics and theory he's gonna show you in five minutes in this video. So go watch this video to understand this point. All right, so you've got your arrangement and sequencing as good as possible. You're not layering things that don't absolutely have to be layered, at least in your loud sections, right? It's okay in quiet or intro and drop down sections, layer all you want, right? But in the loud drops, you gotta checkerboard things, sequence them. You also need to use structured busing so you can see summing issues that are a problem and fix them with side channing or EQing or whatever, um, like I demonstrated in my first video. 
And it also lets you put a whole bunch of little clips all over the place on individual tracks, at their summing points on buses, and so on. Now, after you've taken care of these two things, the next thing to try is frequency slotting. And I showed you that in the last video. I'll demonstrate it one more time here in the rolling line. Um, one of the things I did for this rolling bass was slot this entire mid-range bass sound into a smaller part of the spectrum so that it wasn't competing with the kick and the sub and even the snare really down here. And so it wasn't competing with high frequency elements up here. It lives in its own spot in the spectrum. And by doing this, by removing this energy here and this energy here, we're letting this thing sum with the sub bass and it's not actually adding with where most of the sub bass energy is. So the total summed peaks are lower, right? So this is what I mean by frequency slotting. And you can go back to my first video for a, a slightly better explanation of that. The takeaway here is avoid layering sounds, but if you do have to layer them, then try to make each part of each layer live in its own place in the spectrum. Try to make every layer share the spectrum instead of fight for the spectrum, okay? Now, once you take care of these basics, the other trick is uh, in mixing, you have this notion of your anchor sounds or your framework sounds. These are the sounds that are always gonna be the loudest thing in your mix. In pop music, that's vocals, followed closely by the drums or maybe the kick or maybe the snare alone or maybe both of them. But the vocal is king in pop music. Gotta hear that vocalist, right? Um, in electronic dance music, it's the kick and the snare. Those things have to punch right through the mix, no matter what. So if you're working in a loud, a small dynamic range, if you're working at effectively your mastered loudness, the very first thing you do is set your kick and your snare to be sitting where they need to, to hold down the whole mix. So look at where the, um, the snare and the kick hit on these buses. So yeah, the kick's hitting around negative six lefts, the snare is hitting around negative six, two. Uh, maybe this kick's hitting around negative five lefts in terms of the RMS, the loudness, right? That's because they're the anchor. They need to be the loudest things in the mix, okay? And so when I mix, the kick and the snare are the very first thing I set. I make them as loud as I can. I know I need to get them up into that negative four, negative five, negative six range. And then when I build up all the other mix around that kick and snare, and I, I never touch them after that, right? They just stay there. I build everything up else around them, and then I'm always working at my target loudness. And the problem is, as you're doing that, um, you will run into situations where some sound you want to add to the mix simply cannot be made loud enough to, to balance against that kick and snare and everything else you've created so far. There's a lot of sounds you'll try that sound great at negative 18 RMS. And if you try to, you know, crank the volume fader or do whatever and push that sound so that it sounds natural against a loud kick and snare and a loud sub bass and every other mid bass or whatever sound you've made so far, you'll find some sounds can't be made loud enough or aren't naturally loud enough. And so, by working at a loud level from the very beginning, it's instantly apparent, oh wow, this sound is too quiet. Well, what do I do about that? Can I make it louder? And so you test quickly whether you can make that sound louder by saturating it from the bottom and then clipping the peaks down from the top to squeeze that sound into a smaller dynamic range and then you can raise its level in the mix and maybe you can now make it loud enough to fit in a loud mix, okay? That's kind of what was going on with this rolling line. This rolling bass line by itself, it wasn't loud enough by itself to fit in the context of this kick and snare and sub. 
It was too wimpy. I had to do things to brighten it up with OTT. I had to do things to add saturation to it with Spectre in a certain part of the spectrum that increases perceived loudness. And then I had to crunch it into a limiter to get it loud enough. I saturated it with OTT and Spectre, and then I limited it, clipped it from the top with a special kind of limiter that's effectively a super lightweight limiter um, that is effectively a clipper, but clean. Um, so I had to do all three of those things, saturate from the bottom, clip from the top, to make this thing even loud enough to fit in the context of the mix. And because I was working at a loud level all the way through, as soon as I brought this sound in, I was like, it's too quiet. Let me try some tricks I know. Let's saturate it. Let's clip it. Yeah, it sounds okay like that. It works, right? Especially when you combine it with the sub. And then, of course, when you put it in with the kick and snare. Watch what happens if I turn off the saturation and the limiting. And we'll turn off the original EQ too. This was the original sound. Right? That doesn't fit in the mix. That's way too quiet. Had to do some tricks. Saturate from the bottom, clip from the top. Does it still sound good by itself? And in the context of the full mix? Yes. So that's, that's the essence of this step number four and five and six. Test every sound in the context of a mix that's already loud in the ballpark you're shooting for. If it's not loud enough, saturate it, clip it. Does it still sound okay? Great, you can use that sound. If not, throw that sound away and look for something different. That's the whole point of four, five, and six. Okay, and that's after you've done this stuff. Okay, all right, now step number seven. Um, this is a little bit of a nuance. I'm not gonna go into heavy detail in this mix, in this video. I'll do a separate video that talks specifically about this step. I recommend you start out, unless you know what you're doing and have preferences and you have a beefy computer that can handle this, I recommend you start out with simple clippers across every track and bus. And then later, that's why this says late in the project as you're kind of approaching your final mix down phase. You've built your sequencing and arrangement, you've chosen your sounds, and now you're just trying to figure out if some of those sounds that you've been clipping might sound a little better if you use something a little less distorty than clippers. And that's where limiters come into play. Now, limiters are tricky because if you throw a full mastering limiter on a bunch of tracks and buses, your project's gonna choke, even if you have a beefy machine. So you can't just throw Pro L2 or Elevate or Ozone Maximizer on a bunch of different tracks and have them all running at the same time. It's gonna to be too much latency, too much everything. However, there is one, one product out there that I've found by DMG Audio. It's a thing called Track Limit. It's $50. This is a very, very special kind of limiter in a product line they're calling the Track Range. These are meant to be like the channel buttons you'd see at the top of analog consoles where there'd be like a saturator button, there'd be a compression button, there'd be a this button and a that button, maybe with a few simple knobs. So they built a limiter that's meant to be like a per channel limiter. And what it actually is, it's a um, special version of their full mastering limiter they call Limitless, which by the way is an excellent limiter. I've never talked about it in my videos because it's scary and difficult to describe how to use, but it is my favorite limiter by far these days. And what they did was they took this approach and they scaled it down. They made it seven or eight different algorithms and simplified it and took out a lot of the multiband internal processing and just made a super, super efficient version of it that they call track limit. And this is fantastic. 
it is so low resource, you can just spread this all over your project. And so you'll see, on almost all my tonal buses and tracks, it's track limit, track limit, track limit, track limit, track limit, right? So then over here on my kicks and snares and drum sounds, you'll see I'm back to a saturator, newfangled saturate, newfangled saturate. This is a hard clipper I'm using, right? And then back over here on the pre-master where the tonal stuff is merging with the drum stuff, I'm back to using track limit again, okay? So what's the deal here? It's pretty simple. This is my simplest way of describing this. Clippers are usually gonna sound best on drums and FX tracks and buses. Anything with sharp, pokey, pointy, bright sounds. Clippers work better. They keep the sound punchy and bright and sharp. And that's what you want, especially on kicks and snares. Now, limiters tend to work best on vocal material and any kind of summing point where a sub is present, where, where a, a heavy amount of sub bass is present. And then when it comes to your mid basses, your chord sounds, your lead melodic sounds, it's a toss up. A limiter is usually the best choice, but sometimes a clipper is going to give it that aggressive edge that really makes it stand out better. It kind of depends. So I'll let you digest this and experiment with this on your own. I think you should have a limiter like K-Clip Pro or Newfangled Saturate. And I think you should have a limiter that is low, low resource and, and you're able to put lots of them all over your project. And I think the only one out there that really fits that bill is this thing called track limit. So I recommend getting it and experimenting it. And the whole point of this step is, okay, maybe you started out with just clippers because they're super lightweight. They don't bog down your project. You can have a bunch of synthesizers up and running and still have plenty of resources. But as you get into mix down, test some of those clippers by A, B, and them with a limiter instead. And see which one sounds better and then go with that. So here's the, here's the other reason for um, my clip to zero method. Every single limiter, watch, I'm gonna walk through all these limiters. Where's the threshold set? At zero. Where's the ceiling set? At zero. This one, zero, zero. This one, zero, zero and so on and so forth. Every single instance of track limit on this project is set to clip or limit that peak at zero dBFS. Same for my clippers. Newfangled saturate, there's no drive. It's a hard clipper shape, 100% hard. Input at zero, output, the auto's turned off, so it's clipping at zero, okay? Just when the signal hits zero, clip it hard. The advantage of doing this, and that's true of all my saturated instances too, the advantage of clipping at zero is that then you have a very predictable cascade of clippers. You know exactly where those ceilings are set. And when you need to adjust the amount of clipping you're doing on your overall mix, you don't need to go into each individual limiter and clipper and dink around with like, okay, let me move the, the ceiling back by 2 dB. Or let me, you know, now let me go to this one and move that ceiling to a different spot. Or let me move my threshold to a different spot. No, you don't want to do that. Just set them at zero and forget about them and drive the signal up into them at zero. The peaks, you push those peaks into the clippers and then the peaks get clipped off. And what that allows you to do is this trick I was showing you at the beginning, which is a concept from analog mixing consoles called a VCA group. A lot of analog consoles have these arbitrary faders off to the side and you can basically touch a button and link any fader in the entire console to this one little red colored VCA fader, right? And then you can touch another track anywhere on the console and link it to that same fader. And so the VCA group is this arbitrary group of channels that is independent of your bus faders and your busing structure. 
So I borrow that concept and use it here to put this little device, which is just Bitwig's tool device, right? And Ableton has the same thing with their utility device. Here's what the tool device looks like. I just brought in a tool device, renamed it, dot, dot, VCA, bracket, bracket, enter, right? I renamed it to VCA so that it has this label that stands out to me. I'm gonna get rid of that one. And then I just put the VCA in front of the first place the signal gets clipped, one of your source signals, right? So you'll see a VCA fader right here. I'm sorry, a VCA control right here, right here, right here, and right here. There's, oops, don't wanna turn it off. And there's four places I want to be able to control the volume or gain that's being driven into the limiter Limiter, clipper, clipper. There's, there's, I keep turning that off. There's four places that these signals, my rolling line for the bass, my sub, my snares, and my kicks, there's the place that they're first clipped in the clipping cascade. You don't care about things higher level in the busing cascade, just the first place they're clipped. And so that's what I mean here by, um, is your final mix too loud? Put all the source signals that feed into first order clippers and limiters. Bring it down equally. Now, first order means the first clipper a signal hits. You don't care about everything above it in the, in the busing and summing cascade. So let's kind of work backwards. I have a rolling baseline. It comes through here, it goes through some processing, and then it finally hits its first clipper, or in this case, limiter. So this is where I want to put the VCA, right in front of the first place this sound is clipped after all of its processing that gave it more edge and brightness and saturation, right? And EQ shaping. Now, when we come over to my bait, and th then I ignore this clipper here and this clipper on the midline bus. I don't care about those, just the first place it's clipped, right? Now, for my sub sound, here's my sub. There's no clipper on this track. It's just coming straight out of serum, rolling into the subs bus, and here's where I'm doing my ducking processing and any other processing I might wanna do on it. And then finally it hits the first clipper on its way up the cascade towards my pre-master. So since this is the first place this sub gets clipped, I stick the VCA control right in front of it. And here it is right here, okay? So now we've taken care of these two tonal sounds, right? They roll into the tonal bus. Now let's look at our snares. Nothing's happening on the two individual snare channels, but on the snare bus, they finally run into their first clipper. And so there's the VCA right in front of that clipper. Same for the kick bus. Here's my kick sound. No clipping or limiting happening here directly on this channel. So it rolls up into the kick bus, comes down, goes through some processing, and then finally hits its first clipper. And so I put the VCA right in front of that. And that's it, four sounds. At some point they hit their very first clipper, toss a VCA control right in front of that. Now, then the trick is you need to link all these volume knobs somehow so you can control them all at the same time. Like if I set this to negative 6.7, and I go over here to this snare channel. See, that VCA is also at negative 6.7. If I go over here to the subs VCA on this channel, it's at negative 6.7. If I go to the midline and find where I put the VCA here on this specific track, there it's at, oops, I got that one a little bit off. Um, I'll show you the trick for this because I'm gonna build this. So what's going on here? is I have them all linked to a knob on a MIDI controller. And there's a specific way to do that. You can do it easily in Bitwig and Ableton. I don't know how easy or difficult it is in other DAWs, but I'm gonna show you how I did that. And there's one other trick you have to do, which is also kind of making the uh, fader on your listen bus work in the inverse. At this amount of signal where I'm not changing it at all from where I originally started in my loudest possible form, 
I have the volume control on my lesson bus sitting at negative 12, and the LUFS was hitting around negative 5.8. When I dropped it down to here, the LUFS was sitting at negative 7.2, so that distance from 5.8 to 7.2 is 1.4 dB. And you'll notice now my volume fader has dropped, has gotten louder by 1.4 dB. So I made the signal quieter here going into the clippers, but I made it louder here in the same exact proportion. So it's just kind of this inverse relationship that keeps everything at equal loudness, and that's why as I go up and down in the amount of clipping, your perceived volume sounds exactly the same. Watch. Now, when I say perceived volume, hotter sounds louder, even though it measures equally loud. So there's a little bit of psychoacoustic thing going on here. So you may think when it's cranked up to negative 5.8, it is louder, but that's just the psychoacoustic effect of the uh, mid-range. It's close enough for rock and roll to just pick a, a dB value that compensates. So how do we do this? Let's just take all these off and I'll show you. We're gonna do it from scratch. So I'm going to start by going here and just remove all these manually. I'm gonna close this down for now. I'm also gonna remove all these VCAs. It's super fast to set this up. Get rid of that one, get rid of that one, that one, and that one. So I'm at a point where I want to start testing how much clipping do I really want, okay? Maybe this thing's too hot. Maybe it's louder than I thought it would be because I set my kick and snare at some level. I built up a mix around it and it's, oh my God, this thing's way too hot. So let's take it, let's relax it back down out of the clippers. So again, you think about every source sound. Here's one sound right here. So look through its processing chain until you find the first clipper or limiter. Go ahead and drop a device in here. Um, tool in Bitwig, Utility in Ableton. I recommend renaming it so it really stands out. BCA, right? And then slide it in front of the actual clipper or limiter. All right, so now we have that one set up and make sure its volume is neutral at zero. And then just copy this to the other places you need it. So I'm going to hold control and drag onto my, let's make sure, let's double check my subs, right? There's no clipper or limiter here. There's my first clipper. So I'm going to control copy this and drop it right in front of the limiter there. I'm going to look at my snares, no clippers or limiters on the individual snare signals. The first clipper is right here. So I'm gonna take this one and control drag and drop it right in front of saturate. And then same thing for my kick. Nothing's happening on the kick track itself. It's on the kick bus where it first hits a clipper. So I'm gonna take this and control drag and drop it right there. And I know it works pretty much the same way in Ableton. Get these things set up. They're all sitting at zero by default. Now we're gonna work backward through them and set up mapping to a knob on my keyboard. So in Bitwig, this is how you do it. You open this device and you get these weird gray, greenish overlays on anything that can be mapped to a MIDI input. So I'm gonna click the volume knob. You get this little swirly. I'm gonna turn a certain knob on my keyboard controller. You can see it going up to 6.5 here now. Now I'm gonna drag it back down to zero. And then over here, you're gonna have to play with the scale of how much a, a knob twist on your controller actually changes the value in the DAW. For me and Bitwig and this particular knob on this particular controller, setting the sensitivity to 15 means that I can easily twiddle the knob and increase this or decrease this by exactly one tenth of a decibel at a time. And I can stop wherever I want at exactly one tenth of a decibel. Okay, so that's all I'm doing here. And you'll have to figure this out in Ableton if you use Ableton. So I've set up this one on the, uh, actually this is on my rolling line track. That's what's highlighted right now. 
So now I'm going to walk over here to my substract where the other VCA is, do the same dance, click it, twiddle the knob, set the knob back at zero, come over here and set this to 15%. Then I'm going to come over here to the snares where the next VCA is, right here, click the button, twiddle the knob, put it back at zero. Set this to 15%. And then on my kick bus, click the knob, twiddle the knob on the MIDI controller, set it back to zero. Set this to 15%. All right, so now I've got all these knobs working in unison exactly the same way, moving exactly the same amount when I twist it on my MIDI controller. So that takes care of driving the signal up into the clipper or down out of the clippers, right? Across my entire mix equally, all sounds equal loudness moving up and down into the first clipper they run into. Now the next thing I have to do, or the last thing I have to do is scroll over here to my listen bus and set this fader to work in kind of an inverse way to increase in volume as I decrease the clipping and pull, pull the sound down out of the clippers. I want this to increase proportionally or go in the other direction if I, if I drive harder into the clippers and therefore make things louder. So I'm going to click this fader, twiddle the same exact knob that's moving all my other things, put it back at negative 12 where it started, and then this value I had to experiment with to find the right range, but I'll just, you can figure out, it'll be a good exercise for you <laughs> to figure out how, how much to set this to keep equal loudness. In my case, I think it was 12%. And so the last thing I have to do is click this little button here to flip the polarity so that when I increase these values, this one goes down. Wait, let me think. Yeah, when I increase these, I want this to go downward. And when I decrease these, I want this to go upward to compensate for the volume. So that's why I, I click this button to flip the polarity on it. Okay, and now I'm done. And now as I decrease these, volume goes up. As I increase this, volume goes down from its starting point at 12 and zero. And so that's how you set up the thing I showed you at the beginning where you can just, you can Fine tune, where do you want to clip it? You want to clip it at negative eight lefts, negative seven lefts, somewhere in between, somewhere hotter, somewhere even quieter. Set these up real quick, do it that way. You can, once your final mix is done and you're hearing everything in context and you say, yeah, but it's a little too hot. Let me drop it down, let me bring it up. And this is independent of the actual faders. Like without messing anything else up, without changing the amount of clipping, you can still adjust in microwaves with your faders to get a last little bit of, you know, that kick's still too loud, or oh, that one bass sound is still a little too soft. Let me bring it up a little bit. And you won't be changing the clipping that's happening because all this clipping, amount of clipping is happening pre-fader. It's happening up in the inserts before the fader. Okay, so you'll keep the relative sound, change the relative level in the mix. Um, so I guess that's really all I have to show you in this, this video. Let me see if I talked out this point. Yeah, so, you know, that's the final trick. And that's the main reason I use clipping to zero because it makes this kind of last minute adjustment a one knob affair. Instead of me going into 20 or 30 or 40 different clippers and limiters across my entire project and trying to set little interior controls where I want them. Just have them clip at zero. Drive things into them or pull things out of them. Drive everything into them to change everything all at once the same way. Pull everything down out of them to change everything at once. And again, all you're really changing is that edge of distortion that's being added on top of them. You're changing the clipping. I guess, I'll, I, guess I will demonstrate this one more time just so you really see what's happening. I'm going to open up... Um, Size scope on my drum channel. And I'm going to zoom in to the first kick. Now, 
we have our we have everything set to our original loudness of um, negative five. Negative 5.8. Now this is my kick, snare, kick, snare, right? And every kick, um, we're crushing the transient a little bit, but we're also, because of the way the kick is round and fat, we're also crushing the sine wave just a little bit. See these kind of flat tops being done right here? That's not the way the real kick looks underneath. Now, if I pull it, everything, including the kick, back down out of the clipper, watch how these round out again and get a little more round and full. So even here at about negative six lefts, 6.7, Suddenly, I'm no longer clipping the sine portion of this kick, and that is really audibly cleaning up the kick and making it a little fatter and rounder again, a little less. I'm right on the edge of smushed flubbiness when it's at its original value. So the point is, you're literally pulling things out of the clipper. You're clipping them less, and, and this is happening all over the project. Uh, maybe another useful place to show you this is on the um, tonal bus where the sub and the midline drop are coming together. So let's open the... <sighs> yeah, let's open the tonal bus itself. So we're going to go back up to the loudest that I would ever want to make this mix. It's still too loud. So you can see places where it's touching the zero line, right? Let's go in and take a look at that. Now that doesn't look too bad, right? We don't see the flat laser beam shaving that a clipper would typically do, and that's one reason I'm using a limiter here. Um, but if I were to back off the amount of clipping, you're going to see a little more definition coming in along the top of the combined sub and rolling baseline, because that's what we're looking at, subs and rolling baseline combined. Now we're running at seven and a half luffs. And look, you see so much space now, and even these first peaks are barely touching the line. So a lot of these peaks here are under the line, and this one's barely, not quite touching it right here, okay? If we were to take it down further to negative eight lefts, There's not a single place in this entire waveform that's touching the zero line, right? So again, by taking everything down equally or pushing everything up equally into the clipping threshold at zero, you can control how hard you're hitting any of these signals. And this is why I said between seven and eight lefts, you heard effectively no difference in the, the combined tonal sounds of the mix. It was only the drum and snare that was still changing. And these were as clean as they were going to get. This is what they sound like by themselves. Now, if I push this up to where it was at the negative 5.8 lefts level, listen how much grittier this sounds, because now I'm clipping. See how that sounds really clean now? There's no grit. See how there's grit on that combined sub and mid 
mid-range bass sound. And here, at roughly this point, which is, well, if the whole mix were on, it would be the negative seven lufs point. From here to negative eight lufs, there was no real difference in this sound because it's, it's already pulled almost completely out of the clippers all the way up the cascade through the drops, the midline bus, the sub bus, the tonal bus. It's just nothing's getting clipped. And since I've side chained slices in here to fit the bass and uh, the kick and the snare, this isn't distorting anymore. The only thing that's still distorting as we push louder is the kick and snare, right? So this is what I mean. When you have a bussing structure, when you have oscilloscopes, when you can visualize what your sound looks like and how different bits and pieces are summing together, um, it can really, really make a difference and help you get a loud mix in the mix with minimum damage, minimum compromise. And that's the whole thing you're shooting for is minimum compromise as you're trying to uh, reduce dynamic range with as little distortion as possible or putting distortion in places where it's masked and kind of hidden by the rest of the mix. All right, thanks for hanging with me. Hopefully this is helpful. See you soon.